David Rosenblum, and luckily I do not have a speaking role today since I have no voice. Uh, I regret to start this uh, afternoon's forum uh, by having to announce the passing of our friend Mayor Tom Menino this morning. Uh, he was a great friend and a great friend of this university and a great leader of the city, and I'm sure that we will miss him. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, Ebola is both a huge international and worldwide challenge, a human and economic disaster in the countries uh, in which it is taking place, and a growing, at least political, and perhaps health preparedness issue in the United States. And in the United States in particular, the issue of Ebola is emerging into the narrative of whether or not we believe our government is competent to solve problems, whether we can believe science and accept facts, uh, and so part of our goal today is to uh, enable members of our community uh, to have the benefit of facts uh, and perspectives from people who are actually on a day-to-day -day basis thoroughly engaged uh, in this issue. And I'm very, very grateful uh, to the people who've agreed uh, to speak with us this afternoon and answer our questions, because every one of them is in great demand uh, from, this, uh, uh, from their involvement uh, in this issue. Uh, and so I am grateful that uh, they have taken the time to come uh, with us, this to be with us this afternoon. You've all gotten copies uh, at least of their abbreviated biographies. Uh, and I will leave you to read those so that we can get right into the, the heart of the matter. Uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Nahid Badilia, uh, who is uh, an assistant professor of medicine uh, in the section of infectious diseases uh, here at the Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, and is recently returned from Sierra Leone, where she was directly involved uh, in the Ebola epidemic. She's going to lead off uh, the afternoon and is regrettably <laughs> going to have to leave uh, before the event is over because she is in demand uh, on the Charles River campus. And so uh, she will be leaving uh, shortly after her remarks. She's going to be followed uh, by Dr. Al de Marie, who is the Chief of Infectious Disease for the State Department of Public Health and a longtime friend of the Boston University School of Medicine and reminded me of his involvement in the Finland Laboratory at the old Boston City Hospital years ago. He will then be followed by Mary Clark. Those of you who are MPH students in the room probably want to grow up to be Mary Clark. Uh, she is the director of the Office of Preparedness and Emergency Management at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And she is on her way here. Uh, I suspect this is a very busy day for her. Uh, and uh, she will then be followed by Wendy Mariner, uh, who is the Edward Utley Professor of Law at Health Law at the BU School of Public Health and the Law School. Uh, and she's going to be followed by George Annis, uh, who is the William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor uh, at, and Chair of the Department of Health Law and Bioethics and Human Rights at the School of Public Health and at the Law School. So let me thank them all. Let me thank you for coming, Dr. Vadir. I want to thank the uh, School of Public Health for welcoming me. I want to thank um, Professor Rosenblum for the introduction. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, 
in addition to what Professor Rosenblum said, you know, I'll add for my generation of physicians and public health experts, this is a call to action for us. And for all of us, it is an ethical matter. It's a matter of social justice. And where is a better place to start than where this epidemic actually originated? Um, as was mentioned, I um, was in Sierra Leone. I provided patient care to patients with Ebola at a treatment center that was run by WHO. This was in August. And it's interesting because now, actually, I'm not thinking of me as having come back. I'm going back. I'm going to Liberia next week. Um, I think that my experience over the summer was probably the, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life and potentially the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And um, having seen what I've seen, I think that I'm driven to sort of continue this. And I, I hope that many of you in this audience will do the same in some way, whatever way you're involved. Um, my day job before I got involved in patient care with Ebola was actually I designed the medical response program for BU's Biolab at the Needle at the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory. We're a handful of BSL-4, biosafety level 4 labs that do research in emerging pathogens such as Ebola and Marburg, its sister filovirus. And we're about, we are slated to open in about, let's, I, let's hope, six months, I think is what we're looking at. We are, actually have the CDC as we speak on our campus today and, and the last few days. Um, so when the call came to see if there were experts who had some knowledge of biosafety um, and Ebola as a pathogen that would be willing to help, I, how could I pass up that opportunity? We were supposed to be experts that are supposed to be taking care of these patients on this side of the ocean, but none of us had actually seen a patient. So um, the, before I went, you know, went in, um, I think that this was becoming a call, a call for alarm from WHO and MSF, but what we've really seen is this exponential growth of cases. And um, this is from a mort Morbidity and Mortality Weekly report from the end of September. And what you're seeing is different lines in terms of projecting trajectory of where this epidemic will be. And they represent, if the resources needed, make it to the field during that date. So had the resources gotten there, in September 23rd, you've seen the solid line on the bottom. Had they gotten there October 23rd, it would, you would have been seeing the middle line. We are actually now reaching the November 22nd. There's been a lot of resources that are committed, but as I'll speak to this, not a lot of them actually have made it to ground in an effective way yet. So I don't know if we're gonna actually match this November 23rd, um, November 22nd deadline either. The other part of this that's important is the quality of data, my research is actually decision analysis. I run with models, you know, and the thing about models is that um, they're created on reported data, and reported data um, is dependent on people who are collecting the data in the field, and the number one scarcity in the field right now is human resources in every single dimension of this epidemic, uh, whether it's case finding, whether it's data collection, whether it's direct patient care, we just don't have enough hands to help out. So I, I caution you when you listen to any part about data to always have in the back of your mind that we don't have a complete grasp of what's going on in the field. Um, having said that, this is what the picture looks like. This is from the WHO on October 29th. We've actually had about um, almost 14,000 cases worldwide. Um, and the lighter line are the cases, the darker line, the bar are deaths, and of course the worst hit places are Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Um, and if now we've seen the new case in Mali that raises a lot of alarm uh, for public health experts. My own involvement, as was mentioned, was in Sierra Leone. Um, I went there with my counterpart at Rocky Mountain Laboratory, the, their medical response director. And the minute we land, you know, you can see the impact of this epidemic on daily life. Every single headline. Um, is featured in Ebola. If you can see George Risi, who's on the left on that picture, who's my counterpart as an ID physician there, every single headline in the first newspaper that we picked up on the day of arrival was, checkpoints are not for money making. These are checkpoints for fever scans. They're all over the, oh, the countries that are impacted. No healthcare worker will ever die of Ebola again. WHO coordinator. Koindugu, Ebola success is self-initiated. And the thing that really drives it home is, you know, for us, the weekend that we landed, I was seeing, I was sitting in the taxi looking out and the headline on the, on the top right there, Sierra Leone had run out of body bags. I mean, that is, a vi I had this visceral reaction to the impact of this on those communities. And uh, at the bottom there, you're seeing Kate Hurley, who is one of the nurses from Rocky Mountain Laboratories, who's also volunteering with us there. 
We, uh, we made our way from Freetown to Kenema, which is where we were serving as, as the medical specialist. And you could see that everywhere there were posters about Ebola education. I'm always asked, is it the lack of knowledge that is causing this, this to spread? And I think that early enough this might have been true, but now there is a lot of knowledge about this. A lot of it has to do with mistrust of the healthcare system in some cases. And then now we're in a case where it's actually the lack of access to enough beds for treatment. I mean, we've gotten to a point where the number of people who need beds far exceed what we have. The current prediction for the UN was we need, um, we may have conservatively 10,000 cases. I think we've already passed that. So we would need about 7,000 beds, but only 4,300 beds are actually planned. This is not built, planned, 4,300 beds. So we're we're hopefully seeing a turnaround, but that means the timing of the resources are very important. Going back to the posters, though, I mean, the irony of this was that the Ebola poster had started replacing all the HIV education posters in places. You would see the HIV education posters underneath the other ones. Where we worked, uh, Kenema Hospital, it was a government hospital that had been doing a lot of research with, Ebola, with Lassa fever, which is another viral hemorrhagic fever. And you had doctors and nurses there who had been involved with patients with um, with hemorrhagic fevers, and you know, there was a certain amount of confidence of we can handle this. You know, the difference was Lassa fever has an effective treatment, Ribavirin, that um, is in place. And I think they also underestimated the caseloads they were going to see. Um, they have a capacity. What they did was they retrofitted uh, three of their wards to make it the Ebola treatment ward. And um, they had the capacity of about 60 people. And the census there, and including the time that I was there, was about 80 to 100 most days. By the time that we arrived there, um, Kenema had already lost 35 healthcare workers. Um, and during the time that I was there, and I was, you know, there only about two weeks, a little bit less, we lost um, two nurses, two people that I worked with every day, uh, the last physician who stayed back to help with patient care, who was actually not in the Ebola treatment unit, he was in the regular wards, um, and, and three ancillary healthcare providers. Um, so the impact continues. They have a healthcare staff that has been completely decimated, morally and physically. Um, and you may have heard of Kenema, and the reason why is because aside from the the issues with the healthcare worker deaths and and um, and, um, and illness and such, they were facing other barriers. Um, Ministry of Health couldn't pay them. I mean, if I was working at a job where I was going in risking my life. All my coworkers had died and I wasn't getting paid. I don't know if I would come to work either, to be honest. Um, so I give a lot of kudos to the local health staff because day after day, they would come in and they would give compassionate care to the patients they were inside. Um, so those who stick or stuck around really were some of the most amazing individuals I've ever encountered. It's also the site where you actually saw um, a couple of expats um, get sick. Will Pooley uh, was evacuated about 24 hours after I arrived at the Kenema site. Um, so it's, it's, it's hit home because I actually now know personally many expats, friends, friends of friends who have gotten sick from this illness. And I get asked a lot about what's causing that, you know, is it the dimensions of the disease? And I have to tell you it's not, it's the amount of work to be done and how few people there are and that's what's making it unsafe for everyone. Um, you're looking at the pictures of us in the field. The uh, person on the right is me. I'm, uh, you can usually tell me off as a person who's the shortest in any, any setting, so that's me on the, on the right there. The, the bottom picture there is the rest of our clinical team, and that's us um, plotting um, the beginning of the day in terms of organizing. So the, aside from the patient care element, some of the other actions that are being taken in the impacted countries are, they start from the very top, public health policy. One of the things that Sierra Leone had done uh, briefly before I got there was that they made it illegal for people to harbor patients with Ebola. And I think that went, you know, uh, as inhumane as that may sound, it actually went a long way in, in getting people to come forward with their family members who had illness. Um, because that had been, a, been an issue as well, because people were taking care of the sick at home and that was spreading the cycle of illness among, among communities. The other part is health education. Um, then you've got contact tracing, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is, case finding, and then when the cases are found, triaging about who actually needs to go into the unit and who may potentially not have the disease uh, despite their, their contact with an ill person. And then case management, which is basically treatment, 
and then safe burials. Um, as has been spoken about, I think, in multiple places, um, some of the cultural under, you know, practices in this country had been bathing of the body um, before burial. And a lot of this has changed. It's interesting, when we were driving from uh, Freetown to Kenema, the driver that there was telling us there's been no um, marriages, no baptisms, no, no school. And yet, the only thing that continues is, is funerals. They're still continuing. Um, you know, I, I think we've improved it, but they're still happening. So Ebola tracing, this is basically when you are taking someone who you know has the illness and then you're following out all their contacts for about 21 days and watching to see if any of them develop symptoms. If they do, they're brought in. The decision is made about whether or not they should be um, watched under, uh, if they have the symptoms um, under, under the Ebola treatment unit uh, auspices. And if not, um, the cycle ends there. The trouble, though, is those that are missed contacts. Um, and this is where human resources plays a huge part. If we are missing people who have the disease in the community, this, this is propagating the epidemic. It's continuing. Um, and that's where a lot of the data, you know, caution that I provided earlier in, in my um, remarks kind of goes to as well. So what we would do, um, our daily routine, and I'll speak briefly to this given the time, is that we spent our days sorting out um, who had passed away the night before, who was positive, who was negative that could be discharged. When people come in, they meet the case definition by their presentation. So they have the symptoms, and they have somebody who it has a contact, they go in. But you could have malaria, and you fit that case definition. So our job was to separate those in the suspect ward, which is where people waited until they got their blood test, from those um, who may potentially have Ebola, from others who may not have Ebola. Because um, the worst thing you can do is you have someone wait there for days, and if they didn't have the disease before, they will now have it. And they will leave, and they'll develop symptoms in the, in the community. So you can, you can see why the cycle of propagation continues. And, and the hard part about this is that diagnostics and availability of diagnostics um, plays a huge part of this. But there aren't that many labs that are doing PCR testing, polymerase chain reaction testing, um, for Ebola, which means that you could wait three days. The, the sample has to be transported from the ward, and you have to wait for the results. Um, we tried our best. We separated those who are ill from those who didn't look that ill. But this disease is such that you have a very variable course so tomorrow, the person that we thought didn't look that bad will get sick. And, and that's, that's where the challenges come in. We then spent the rest of the day um, discharging patients who actually were negative. They've gone through their disease. You know, um, We saw people who would come in, and they would have mild symptoms and um, flu-like symptoms to begin with, and they would recover. And then they would get discharged when their blood test came back negative, and they didn't have any more virus. One of my favorite stories to tell is um, we had a strike with phlebotomists for a few days. And so I had this young guy who had had his symptoms for about five days. And, um, you know, for the two days that he was in the unit waiting for his blood test to come back, I would come in and he would say, Doctor, you're going to give me Ebola while I'm here. And for two days I would say, I'm sorry, I'm just waiting for your blood test. The minute I get it, you know, we'll get it to you. And, and then on his fifth day of, of illness, he was completely asymptomatic. And I go up to him and I said, I have your test result. You're positive. And he was so confused. He's like, what does this mean? And I said, it's that you had Ebola and you didn't even know it. And now you're cured and you're immune to the strain. So you have that extreme. And then on the other hand, you have people who have a very rapid decline. You know, they didn't get into care early enough. What we found was um, you needed to make it to care early enough with hydration, continued hydration in the community and continued hydration in the units to really have a good course. Other, our other challenges were um, how do we keep uh, the unit safe for the patients, and how do we keep the unit safe for the healthcare workers? Um, of course, personal protective equipment, which has been part of a huge amount of discussion on this side of the ocean, is a big part of it, but that isn't it. That isn't the only thing. Um, we also have to look at safe clinical practices. Is it safe to put an intravenous line in this patient? Um, is it uh, safe to practice, um, to draw blood on this child who's agitated? So we continuously had to um, look at our own safety and weight against the, the patient's survival. Um, the other things that we did was, as I mentioned, se separating the suspects from the confirmed and then reducing the visitors and keeping the environment clean. This is the other part why West Africa is so different from the U.S. Um, disinfection of the environment, particularly with a large patient load and very limited hands, was very difficult for us. 
Um, I'll spoke a little bit about the diagnostic protocols and challenges, and I mentioned the variability. I will mention this, though, that most people, they imagine Ebola patients as um, patients who are coming in with hemorrhagic features. We didn't see that. We saw just ill patients who had a voluminous vomitus and diarrhea. They were dehydrated. They were dying of shock from dehydration. They weren't dying of bleeding. You know, these look like just um, any sick patients that you may find here with shock. And the treatment that we gave them was pretty basic. And yet, you know, I have to tell you, for those who made it into care in time, our mortality rate in, in, in the people who coming in, were coming into care in time was about 40 percent. Imagine what we can do with enough hands. Imagine how far we can drive this down. And uh, that's why, again, I'll, I'll underline this human resources is the major challenge right now um, and why the discussion about healthcare workers here is so important. Um, the other challenges that we had was providing care in the uh, personal protective equipment. It's very difficult to be able to do that. Um, your vision is, is decreased. You're sweating all the time. Then the managing the staff safety, as I mentioned. In this environment, you depend on everyone else for your safety and they depend on you. It's a symbiotic relationship. You practicing safe medicine, safe practices impacts everybody else because if you become ill, you could pass it on to your co-health care workers, as, happen as it happened in a lot of local staff and then lack of uh, shortage of physical resources such as testing equipment. So um, I talked a little bit about balancing your own safety with survival. You know, the other kind of things that we faced where we want to provide more, and it's really hard when you have to ration care. That's not something that should happen, and it does all the time right now because of that, because you have to make an assessment of not who's the sickest, but who will get the most from the care you're providing when you only have four physicians for about 100 patients. Um, and that shouldn't be happening. And the other is making decisions against um, what benefits the patients versus what benefits the larger public health. Bringing people in, um, even if they are only on the lower side of suspicion, as long as they meet the case definition, protects the public. Um, so I'll stop there. The only other thing I'll say is that's tough is the entire healthcare system is decimated. So you, people have nowhere else to go. They present to your Ebola treatment unit, and now you have patients who are ill who don't have Ebola, but they are so sick they can't go anywhere else. So what do you do? Do you keep them in the unit and they get sick there, or do you throw them out to the streets and they may not get any other care anywhere else? And these are decisions that, again, I think are an unfortunate side effect of this epidemic. So I'll end there. I'll give, show you this picture, and it's um, the happiest days uh, that we had there were when we discharged people. We walked out with a list of all the people who were negative, and we discharged a lot of people from that unit. So I'll just end on a hopeful note there. Thank you. I, I am so glad that Nahid started this. I'm I, we should leave this picture up there because it reminds us that the real problem with Ebola is not here. It's there in these countries. Are, and, and one of the other things that is going in abeyance in the face of Ebola is uh, childhood immunization and a variety of other health care and public health interventions in these countries. It's going to have a, a, a huge secondary impact and the impact on their economies after years of uh, social and uh, political disruption. Finally, they were getting to the point of, of uh, developing from those bad years, and now that is all being turned around in the face of this the huge humanitarian disaster. So I'm going to talk about Ebola from the standpoint of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Orders of magnitude different, and you wouldn't know that uh, considering the media attention, but uh, I just want to say that I, I am not, you know, what I'm talking about is not really an Ebola problem. It's primarily an Ebola fear problem, and the problem is there, and the only way that problem is going to end for them, and uh, this problem is going to end for us, is with the control of that outbreak, and that's going to take the kind of work that Nahid and her colleagues are doing. Because we know, we know, if you look at all the Ebola outbreaks in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, there's a concerted response early on. You isolate the patients, you trace the contacts, you look for cases, and you can control these epidemics in two months. And 
One has to think, you know, back, let's say, April when there were a couple hundred cases in Guinea, if there was a concerted effort to get that under control, since it was already unprecedented both in size and geography, we may not be in this circumstance today. So, yeah, you know, there's no way to go back and change the way things happen, but I think the lessons here need to be learned for the future because I don't think that this is going to end. I think with the socio-demographic and um, socioeconomic changes in, in, uh, in Africa, the kind of interaction between rural and remote areas and the cities is going to continue and the tr increased movement of people is going to continue. So we have to expect that there's going to – unless we can figure out how to make them not happen, that these outbreaks are going to happen. So that being said, I'm, I'm going to talk about some perspectives from a Massachusetts standpoint and some of the things that we're trying to do. We are – Contrary to to what is in the globe today, we are trying <laughs> to uh, raise public awareness about what the real issues are. The real issues aren't as exciting sometimes as the not real issues, so that's all, always a difficult circumstance. Uh, and we are trying to focus on interventions that we can put in place that will both address people's fear and address the reality that there may be people arriving, incubating Ebola virus disease or with Ebola virus disease, and, and a certain level of preparation needs to be done for that. And we're, we're looking at what the experience has been uh, in the parts of the world where this occurs as regular outbreaks, and we're looking at the experience that we've had in the United States as limited, as limited as that experience is, to try to come up with interventions and messaging that will work to the advantage of public safety and public health. And so, so the kinds of things we're looking at is, uh, you know, what, what, what is the natural history of infection? How, how does that relate to people's, to people's risk? And, you know, the, the, uh, in terms of transmissibility, uh, the irony is it, it's, a, it's a very infectious virus. It looks like the inoculum size, the dose necessary to cause infection is relatively low but it requires close physical contact with the blood and body fluids of somebody with the infection. So it's not airborne, and um, there's no magical uh, transmission. That, uh, the, you know, one of the big questions we get from all sectors, from sectors where I, you know, they really have to explain to me how exactly do you think a patient with Ebola is going to wind up in your daycare center? Um, <laughs> But, you know, people are frightened and, and they really want to be prepared for Ebola and they want to buy personal protective equipment as if that's the answer, personal protective equipment. And we have to sort of step back and say, what, what, is, what are the interventions, the controls for occupational health? Personal protective equipment is the last resort. There are administrative work practice controls uh, if you can't eliminate the risk entirely or, or control, it, uh, control the exposure entirely. There are other things you can do, and, and what we've come up with is a six-foot difference distance. So theoretically, with droplet uh, droplet transmission, three feet should be enough, but we're going to say six feet. So if you're six feet away from someone, and this this applies to public safety, applies to people in healthcare facilities, your first defense is to ask someone from six feet away if they're febrile. Have you been in one of these countries in the last 21 days? And if they say no, you're essentially done because you have to know someone with Ebola to get Ebola. And that, you, and, and you have to know uh, uh, sort of the fundamental geography of Africa to know that Kenya is nowhere near <laughs> these countries. So, you know, it, it's just a lot of work to make sure that people are aware of that. And, and we're, we're now trying to make sure that uh, every suspect Ebola case that there's a call to the uh, Bureau of Infectious Disease, the epidemiologist at the Department of Public Health, because we find if we can walk people through things at the beginning, then uh, the outcome tends to be better. So these, are, these are not hazmat events. So we're really trying to convince people distance is your best protection. In fact, close contact with PPE is probably more hazardous than keeping your distance, because if your PPE gets contaminated and you get contaminated taking it off, it puts you at risk. 
The other thing we're looking at is what is the evidence in terms of infectiousness during stages of the disease, and I think there's a lot of evidence that you're least infectious in the early stage of the disease. In fact, with some PCR assays for virus, you can have non-detectable virus in the first 72 hours of illness. So we, we know and we're convinced that absolutely that if you don't have symptoms, you're not infected, but infectious, but even during the early part of infection, you're probably certainly much less infectious than you are in the later stages. And if you look at the U.S. experience, Mr. Duncan in Texas had about 100 community contacts, household contacts, none of whom developed uh, Ebola. And he had multiple hospital contacts, and, and it was basically two nurses who took care of him at, uh, really at the end stage of his disease with enormous potential for contamination and contact with body fluids who got infected. So I think we have to put this in perspective. We have to address people's fears legitimately, credibly, and hopefully successfully, uh, but we also have to, have to look at what the real challenges are here. Now, one challenge that came up very early in terms of hospitals' capacity to take care of these patients is laboratory, you know, collecting the specimens, transferring to the laboratory, doing it in the laboratory. I can't say, I can't say we fixed that yet, but we've come very much further than we were a couple of uh, months ago to look at what laboratories can do to assure the safety of the laboratory staff in doing testing because we don't want to happen what we've seen happen in some circumstances. A patient presents with a febrile illness with a sort of a small potential for it being Ebola and they actually have malaria and it's not diagnosed. You can die of falciparum malaria while people are waiting around worried about Ebola. So we want to make sure that all of the receiving facilities have the basic capacity to differentiate other causes of uh, febrile illness in people at risk, only in people at risk, um, from Ebola. And we've had some good experiences with that, actually, in community hospitals where people have presented with febrile illness. And, and so far, obviously, there have been no Ebola cases, but we've had uh, maybe one to two dozen cases of people with febrile illness with a potential for risk, recent travel in that part of the world, and, and essentially all of them have malaria. So if that doesn't get diagnosed, if that doesn't get treated, then these people could have a bad outcome while people are being worried about uh, Ebola virus infection. So we're trying to work with the healthcare facilities, work around some of these issues. Other issues that's come up, uh, waste disposal. You know, we, we created a hazardous, medical hazardous waste removal system that was built to protect us against Ebola virus because it was built to protect against known and unknown risks. And to try to put an ad hoc system to get around the refusal for, uh, of the removal of that waste puts people at more risk, not at less risk because the whole system was put in place to protect from those kinds of viruses. So we're, we're hoping that uh, some of the issues related to the removal of hazardous waste from healthcare facilities can be addressed because it's another impediment to responding to this. Uh, another question that comes up constantly is sewerage. If we did have an Ebola patient, could they use a toilet? What would you do? I would flush the toilet and because the, <laughs> the sanitary sewer system was created for Ebola. It was created to remove hazardous microorganisms from our living space. And I am totally convinced that because this is a very um, fragile virus on the, on the level of HIV, it, there's a, actually no, it, it's a theoretical concern, but there's no documented evidence that fomites or inanimate surfaces transmit Ebola. And uh, so, you know, I, I think that the way sewage is handled should be totally adequate for Ebola. Do I think that uh, there'll be some pouring of the bleach down the drain? Yeah, I, I think so if it happened. But I think that could have untoward consequences in terms of how that changes the way sewage is uh, supposed to be processed in the course of it getting away from us. So I think all of these are just sort of examples of some of the issues that have come up. And, and even to the point now, we're hearing from some providers who say, I don't know how to take care of an Ebola patient. It's dangerous. I don't want to take care of an Ebola patient. I should be excused from taking care of an Ebola patient. Now, if you're like me and you lived through 
the early 1980s. We've heard that before. We've heard people say, I don't want to take care of HIV-infected people. I don't know anything about it, and uh, it's too dangerous. And, and that is not something that I wanted to experience again because we have to take care of these individuals. And uh, what we're doing at, at the state level in terms of people coming from those countries now, the, the CDC, the federal government decided to screen everybody at the arriving airports. They made it so theoretically they're getting 100%. They probably are pretty much getting 100% of people so, whose point of origin in one of those countries. They're uh, interviewing them and counseling them at the airport. They're giving them a kit with a thermometer. They're giving a checklist for the temperature. And this week, CDC uh, proposed what they would like to do about these arrivals. And now this is the third classification system we've had. But it goes from high risk to some risk to low but no risk. Um, and uh, what CDC would like to do is direct observation quarantine for people at high risk. And that, that would be people, you know, they got fluid splashed in their face, they had unprotected exposure to blood and body fluids, they're actually at high risk. And I think everybody sort of agrees that, you know, they should stay on their own uh, and uh, check their temperature twice a day and not interact in any significant degree with, with others. Uh, and then for the some risk, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. But they still want for the some and the high risk for the health department to visit these people every day. Personally, I think that's probably more than we have to do, but uh, we are, you know, we're following that advice and we're going to see how that works out. And then for the low risk, which has been so far everybody that's arrived uh, has been in the low risk category, then we're, we're just going to have them check their temperature twice a day and, and, and have them contact us on a, on a daily basis. Basically what the CDC is recommending. Now what I expect will happen is we'll start getting healthcare workers coming back from that part of the world after providing care and, and assistance over there. And some of them are going to be in the some risk. Many of them are going to be in some risk, occasionally in the high risk. And, and my feeling is we should be embracing them with gratitude, not shunning them and locking them up. So, you know, I, I, I think we're, we're agreed in the Department of Public Health that we, we are going to put in uh, maybe measures that are more than necessary, but I think it's hard to avoid right now, but we're going to uh, be very diligent in, in applying the least restrictive measures to returning people that assures the public health. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mary Clark. I am the director of the Office of Preparedness and Emergency Management at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, I've been in that position for about seven years this month. Um, it feels like nine or ten right now because of this month. Um, but I'm going to talk a little about what we do at the department um, in instances like this. Um, and I want to focus on instances like this because one of the most dangerous things that happens um, is when we begin to treat something that we know how to work with as something totally unique and something that we need to create new systems for. Um, we have been working in emergencies in public health for well beyond the, my time here and others' time here. Um, public health does what it does and it does it very well. Um, my role in the department is looking at how we build capacity to respond to emergencies, take the core public health practices and make sure that we can use them to respond to emergencies. So I'm going to talk a little about what we've done in the department starting back in August, just in terms of preparedness and emergency management. So as, as news began to come out about um, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, um, we were slow in the United States to get a lot of news. Nobody paid a lot of attention. But as we did begin to get reports at the department, one of the things that we do is monitor the information that is out there and begin to think about how could this impact us if we did see something here. What are the things that we would need to think about? What is the planning that we would need to do? Who is involved in that? So we established a coordinating committee back in August with people from the relevant bureaus who might work on this to begin looking at what the information was, seeing whether there were gaps that we might identify here thinking about what the likelihood was of seeing a case of Ebola in Massachusetts and thinking about who we would need to partner with. So we started with our office, our commissioner's office, 
clearly the Bureau of Infectious Disease, the group that oversees our hospitals and emergency medical services, um, our legislative affairs and our, and our um, communications office, the folks who would be involved in putting out information or thinking about what a response would be. Um, we initially started meeting um, every day just to get a handle on what the information was and think about what we might need to do. Um, and we moved back to biweekly meetings and conference calls to talk about what we were seeing and what information we were getting and to, to try to get a sense of what the concerns were in the public, watching the media, um, watching the international news and trying to think about what we would need to do. Um, we um, refocused attention when, we, when the original healthcare workers were brought back to the United States for treatment. Um, media attention grew tremendously when this became an issue that actually seemed to affect the United States as opposed to other countries. Um, and that in itself raises challenges for how you prepare a response um, when you go from very little attention to a huge amount of attention, even though the impact is really still incredibly small. Um, but that meant there were more activities that we needed to do. So um, we began working again in our groups and looking at what sort of guidance we might need to do, who we needed to work with, um, and what we needed to ramp up in terms of getting information out. Um, initially, the work was happening largely within the Department of Public Health, um, and we were sharing information with other partners. So, um, as I think Al said, in, in August, we were working with the Boston Public Health Commission and others to begin looking at guidance because we were getting questions from healthcare providers about what they should do if they saw someone that they thought had Ebola. So, getting the messaging out about how it's actually transmitted and how unlikely it was for them to see someone walking in off of the street with Ebola was one of the first things that we did. And so we worked with Boston Public Health Commission to get messaging out. Um, we also did what we often do um, in situations like this. We started in H1N1 and we have done it since. We started setting up conference calls, statewide conference calls or single discipline conference calls to talk with people about what we knew, about what the facts about the disease were, about what we thought was likely to happen in Massachusetts, if anything, and to begin to get questions. So um, we started setting up those calls and we have had calls and are continuing to have calls with hospitals, colleges and universities, local health, emergency medical services, um, community health centers, public safety including police and fire and emergency management, long-term care facilities, home care agencies, um, the, um, the emergency support function team for Massachusetts, um, and others. Um, we are happy to talk to anyone who wants to talk to us and bring them on our call so that we can provide information about what we know, about what the appropriate guidance is, and to help answer questions for them about how they can apply that guidance in whatever circumstance they may be in. Um, we have also had the opportunity to speak twice to the Joint Committee on Public Health, as well as brief the congressional delegation um, a couple of times for Massachusetts on what the department is doing, what we're seeing, and what the questions are that um, are coming up. As there has been more attention on this, um, our department has actually moved into our incident command structure, um, which we don't always do for smaller emergencies, and given that we have no cases, if there weren't the media attention, I'm not sure we would be in incident command, but we are. Um, and we have been that way for a while. Um, one of the other things we have done is actually, um, I may have mentioned we briefed the emergency management agency early on in this so that they would know what's going on and they could work with their public safety partners. Um, because we do need to work across all of the disciplines, um, the governor has established a unified command um, for the Ebola response and so um, I am working on behalf of the department with um, Under Secretary Kurt Schwartz at NEMA to have a unified approach to how we do this. So we are sharing information across our two worlds um, and looking to see what guidance we provide and how we make sure that everyone is on the same page as we do a response. The, the thing you don't want most often is people going off in different directions, not knowing what the central message is, not knowing what the facts are, and not knowing how to respond to that. So looking at a unified, a, a modified unified command structure has helped us coordinate some of that messaging and begin to identify 
some of the concerns that we have seen from public safety and others. Um, as Dr. Di Maria said, um, we saw a lot of the same questions around AIDS and HIV, and that's actually when I met Dr. Di Maria when we went out and talked to hospitals about why it was that they did actually need to treat people with AIDS and HIV. Um, but we see some of the same concerns about people not wanting to treat an individual, not so much that I'm hearing um, directly from physicians and nurses, although there are concerns, but people who may not be as used to, to working with infectious disease, there are concerns about what they should do. So we are able to work with MEMA to get messaging out to them. Um, we are able to work with them about identifying what the appropriate personal protective equipment standards are across all of the disciplines so we don't have fire services going in one direction and thinking this is all a hazmat situation and we have healthcare workers going in another. Um, that's confusing to healthcare workers, but it's even more confusing to the public when they see different professions who respond to things like this on a day-to-day -day basis doing different things. It's very hard to explain to them why this town does it this way and this town does it that way. Um, so Unified Command is helping us talk through those issues and respond to them and have a single way of getting messaging up um, through our secretariats and up to the governor. In terms of some of the things that we have done, and these are things we do in any public health event or emergency, um, as Dr. DiMaria said, we, we work on clinical guidance, on making sure that we understand the CDC guidance, look at how we push that out to all of our clinical providers so that they understand it and they have an opportunity to ask questions about it. Um, so again, the phone calls that we have had have been open to hospitals and healthcare providers across the state. Our initial statewide conference call had 1,000 lines in use. Our second call had 940 lines in use, and our third call had 500, which either means they're tired of listening to us, which I'm okay with, or that they are feeling more comfortable with the information that, that we are putting out, and I'm hoping it's the latter. Um, it's what we've seen in previous events, H1N1, we did the similar type of calls, and as people got more comfortable with the information and understood the guidance, they felt less of a need to spend an hour and a half with us on a weekly basis hearing the guidance and hearing discussions. We have also been able to work closely through Unified Command with MEMA, our Emergency Management Agency, and Public Safety to push out information about how they can get in touch with the Public Health Department and we can walk them through questions. If they show up to do an, an ambulance transport um, from somewhere and they have questions about the person they're transporting might be a risk to them. We don't want them to call a hazmat event um, and have the news helicopters from Channel 7 circling over the urgent care facility, we would prefer that they call our epidemiology program and an epidemiologist at any point of the day or night can walk them through what the questions are that they need to ask. And as Dr. Di Maria said, if, if the first question is, have you traveled in Sierra Leone, Guinea, or Liberia in the last 21 days, and they say no, then there is very little chance or zero chance that, that they actually have Ebola. So that has helped alleviate some of the concerns for EMS in the field, fire services, or private ambulances who might have questions. Um, and we are hoping that prevents um, or helps communities feel like they don't need to call a large-scale event, which does then raise the, the attention of the public. It gets municipal leaders involved. It gets state leaders involved. And that just makes everything a bit more complicated. We have also been one of a handful of states that has had our state public health lab certified to do testing for Ebola. Um, that has been in place for a while, and so we have the capacity. If there is an event where we actually do clinically believe there's a need for testing, we can have that done at our state lab with confirmation by the CDC. Um, and then we have, um, as we do in any event like this, as we did during H1N1, as we did during SARS, um, we review the legal provisions that we have in place. Um, isolation and quarantine are not new concepts. Um, they are something that our public health department um, looks at and thinks about in measles cases, in tuberculosis. These are, these are core public health principles, and we are not uncomfortable with them, but we do see that people who don't work with them day in and day out, public safety and others who may have a role in certain instances are concerned. So um, this morning we had a meeting with the council from a variety of public safety agencies and associations to walk them through 
active monitoring and what is happening now in terms of individuals who are in the state um, who may have been in the three countries because there is an active monitoring program now and to walk them through what the legal protections are as well as what the, um, the law is regarding um, enforcement of mandatory quarantine were we to have to go in an individual instance to mandatory quarantine of an individual. Um, so part of our role is always educating um, our partners and making sure that they understand and that we can answer their questions. Um, the other things we have done have mainly focused on getting information out to the public as best we can. Um, we early on established a single web page on the DPH website where we would collect all of our guidance. We would link to the CDC and the World Health Organization and provide information for people who were concerned and wanted to get information. And we have continued to add information to that website. Um, we have also um, distributed flyers. We, the CDC developed a very simple one-page um, fact sheet on how you do not get Ebola. Um, and we have distributed that through all of our listservs. We have thousands of people on our listservs through um, public safety, which has gone out to emergency management and police. We're distributing it to college and universities. Every, anyone we can think of to distribute it to, we are distributing it and trying to get it out. It's available in English, Spanish, and French. Um, and we're happy to provide copies to, if BU wants any. Um, but we are getting that out and we are trying to provide information. And then finally, we are also um, trying to make it as easy as possible for the public to ask us questions or clinicians. So one of the things we have done in the past and we have just done again is set up a separate email box for people to send messages because we were all um, getting individual messages and trying to make sure that messages that went to Al or to me or to the commissioner or the chief of staff got into one place was a little challenging when you're getting um, multiple messages a day. So we now have a single mailbox. Um, if you have questions, you can reach us through askebola at state.ma.us. Um, and we are collecting all of those questions. We are triaging them and we are sending um, information and answers back out to people as well as using that as a way to identify whether there is a lack of clarity in any of our guidance that we need to address or whether there are areas for guidance that we haven't done yet. And so we can begin to address those. Um, I think Harold is just about to show me that I'm out of time. So thank you very much um, and I look forward to the question and answer session. Okay, we're going to continue on. Uh, smooth transition here, I hope. Uh, you heard about Massachusetts law. Uh, the next and final two talks are going to be mine talking about international human rights law, and Professor Mariner then is going to talk about domestic law in the U.S. And the division is there because there are actually, as you've heard, uh, two epidemics going on. There's an Ebola epidemic going on in Western Africa, and there is an epidemic of ignorance going on in the United States. <laughs> and, and they have to be dealt with uh, in different ways, right? Uh, internationally, we've learned a lot from this uh, pandemic already in terms of how prepared we are and what's going on. Uh, Dr. Chan declared Ebola and a public health emergency of international proportions uh, in August. Virtually everybody who knows anything about this, but we'll start with the people who are actually on the ground there, believe that should have been done much earlier, perhaps in April, uh, maybe even before that. And uh, as Al said, then the, the, the epidemic could have been controlled. Uh, she didn't do that. Uh, and her authority to do that, to declare a, a public health emergency of international concern, comes from the international health regulations, 
which were developed, I mean, they've been around a long time, but they were su significantly changed after SOC, because the idea was this was an important thing to call the, the international community's attention to what's going on. Uh, and the, but they have two principles, and you should know that one is very important, we'll talk a lot about that, and it's a fundamental principle of all United Nations agencies that they should be based on respect for dignity and human rights and the fundamental freedoms of people. And I, I think that's absolutely right. But the second one is clearly uh, dysfunctional, that the sovereign right of each state to legislate and implement health policies shall be respected. Uh, in other words, these are not regulations. These are guidelines. You remember Ghostbusters when uh, Bill Murray was uh, being seduced uh, by Sigourney Weaver, uh, he first said, you know, I have a rule against having sex with <laughs> spirits uh, from beyond. And then he thought about it a second. Maybe it's more like a guideline. <laughs> uh, that's what these are. These are guidelines, and they really are, and they should be, because they're not enforceable, because each, each country uh, has the right to accept or reject uh, any, of these, any of these things. But the idea for them came from uh, basically these, these four uh, international pandemics, and the other two that have been declared uh, international pandemics have been the H1N1 in 2009, and then polio earlier this year. But you have to ask yourself how we did it about both of those and whether that helped or not. All right. The uh, WHO's own emergency response framework is that they provide leadership, information, technical expertise, and logistics. And that's exactly what Doctors Without Borders asked them to do over and over again uh, this summer. And finally, the WHO just said, we can't. We cannot respond to this epidemic. We don't have the staff. We don't have the money. We don't have the political will, basically. That we just can't do it. Uh, and that was a shock to Doctors Without Borders. Right? They were there on the ground. They, they, they and, and uh, uh, Samaritan's Perth have, were the two major uh, NGOs doing, uh, doing work on the ground. And, and they were actually they were shocked that WHO couldn't help. Uh, as many of you know, Medicine Sans Frontieres, or Doctors Without Borders, is founded on this notion of duty to interfere, uh, which is that compassion and sickness knows no boundaries, so neither do we. We're going to go in and help sick people, regardless of whether the government uh, invites us in or not. Now, they've lately had to change a little bit of their uh, philosophy to protect themselves, now that doctors are getting shot and killed in, in countries around the world. They used to remember when they used to be neutral and, and, and be privileged? But nonetheless, that's their fundamental premise, and it's a good one, that there's universal human rights, universal suffering, and their job is to take care of it on a global level, not an individual country level. Now, one might say, and I would have said, well, why don't the NGOs work together? Maybe they can take the leadership. Well, this is the other giant, or NGOs, they're not, it's doctors of the world. That's a split off <laughs> from, <laughs> from Doctors Without Borders. NGOs, and I'll tell you this from 20 years in the NGO world, NGOs do not cooperate with each other. They do not get along. They are virtually all interested in what they do and setting their own mission and doing their own thing and, and raising their own, <laughs> own money. So that's not going to be, a, that's not gonna be a, uh, uh, a way to get around this. Uh, another NGO that's over there, <laughs> Partners in Health, we're all familiar with that one since we're from Boston, but we'd probably be familiar with it anyway. And and you know, Paul Farmer, of course, has made the point over and over again that this disease is primarily, like most diseases, a disease of poverty, all right? And that our obligation should be to help the poorest of the poor, literally, and that, that's Paul's philosophy. Uh, Jim Kim, his former colleague uh, at Partners in Health, is now, as you know, the president of the World Bank. And he's been pushing the World Bank to deal with poverty, and according to the Wall Street Journal, we read a couple, People at the World Bank don't like this at all. <laughs> you know, they, uh, they really resent not being able to fly first class or business class around the world now that, they're, that their perks are being taken away and, and Jim Kim really wants to help poor people. Uh, but this is a very powerful combination. But can they lead? No, they can't lead. They can help. They can support. They would be the first to say there's a vacuum of leadership on the international level. So the question to everyone is, do we try to prop up the WHO again so that they can perform decently the next time around? Or do we really, is it time for another structure, as has been suggested? And if so, what is it? Again, I don't, I don't argue, it's not NGO-based. It still has to be government-based somehow, okay? Everything the government does, everything the UN does has to be consistent with all these declarations. You're familiar with them. 
and rightfully so. Uh, and the other point that's worth noting, as this, so I have this little thing down here, the Syracusa principles, is that there are exceptions to most things that, uh, that most human rights rules, except some very core ones, like, anti, like discrimination. You can't discriminate against people. You can't, if you're going to quarantine them, it has to be with the least restrictive alternative. I assume Professor Meredith may mention that or not. That's like the constitutional uh, requirement in the United States, but it's also an international law requirement. Right? The field of health and human rights is developed uh, with the notion that health and human rights go together. They're inextricably linked. And uh, that, again, that's an international, an international <laughs> premise. It doesn't apply to the United States, right? We're still a long ways away from having a right to health in, in the US. But Jonathan Mann was really the father of uh, the health and human rights movement, and, and, and rightfully so. And he recognized the need for human rights at the beginning of the HIV epidemic. When he went over to Africa and he said, he found that I have nothing to offer. I have no medicine, I have no treatment, but these people are getting thrown out of their houses, they're losing their jobs, uh, they're being viciously discriminated against. Law is much more important than medicine here. And then he came to believe that you had to do both of them together. And uh, if you want to look up some heavy duty law in his comment 14 on, on the right to health, uh, outlines the individual government's responsibility, respect, protect, and fulfill the right to health but it also outlines the individual government's responsibility to help each other when there is an emergency, a humanitarian emergency like, like the Ebola crisis. Uh, we also see uh, major discrimination uh, in already. This is in Freetown. You saw the, saw the, the map about this. When the, uh, when the poor part of Freetown was quarantined, all right, you, again, you can't do that under international law, unless it's the least restrictive alternative, and it's likely to be effective. And it's never going to be either one, I would suggest to you. Mass quarantine will never, ever work. People will always leave. People will be, uh, you know, are, are stuck in there where the virus is likely to just get transmitted. And thank God all the countries have stopped doing this, uh, even their three-day thing. This is a set of ethical rules, real quick. You don't, I'm going to do it quick. Uh, which I think are real ethical rules in a pandemic. Prevention has to remain the primary goal. Government has the primary responsibility, and therefore must follow basic human rights law. Whatever you do must be sustainable, and there's no d disaster exceptions to inform consent for research. And this is going to be one of the hardest issues to deal with, is research on drugs that don't exist are being, uh, there's some phase one issues, but doing research on drugs and vaccines during the pandemic is a major challenge. And it's being done in the shadow of uh, this meningitis research, which was done by Pfizer, totally illegal, done without consent. It's been a major, major issue. I just reviewed, well, it's a publication that they're working on at WHO. And then the six chapters, written by six different people, <laughs> five of them use this as their major case study. <laughs> the, uh, so it's a big deal in Africa, and obviously it took place in Nigeria. And uh, it led to people stopping doing polio, polio vaccine trials there. It led to them being suspicious of all American-run drug trials, et cetera. But if you're going to do one thing we know, informed consent is absolutely critical. And it's very, it's, you're not going to be able to have a bunch of white guys come in and do experiments on, on, on citizens of these countries. Told you sovereignty is, is the major bottleneck issue of international cooperation, and, and which meant that when the president decided it was time, and I think he did, it was time for the United States to get involved, he couldn't just get involved. He had to be invited. It had to have the president of Liberia invited the U.S. to come, invited the U.S. to come. And that's when we could go into another country. Otherwise, it would be called an invasion, right? It would be called an act of war. Uh, but, but she did, and she was desperate, and Liberia was desperate. All right? And it's of interest, probably to political scientists more than anybody else, that the United States goes to Liberia, right? France goes to Guinea, and the UK goes to Sierra Leone, their former colony. Well, Liberia is not our former colony, but it was created by freed slaves, so we feel an affinity to it. But we don't go. We don't. We're not going anywhere near Guinea and Sierra Leone, and those other countries aren't going anywhere near Liberia, and it's because of this this kind of weird thing. Uh, when the president decided the U.S. would get involved, 
He said, we're going to take the leadership role. Now, I don't know how that's worked out, you argue. But this is what he said, we're going to control the outbreak, address the economic ripple effects, coordinate, coordinate a broader global response, and build up a public health system. And this is what he was going to do. The next day, Ban Ki-moon said, no, no. He didn't say no, no. He said, no, the UN will take the role. The UN, the UN will take the leadership role. Uh, if they have, they've kept it pretty quiet. I, mean, I really, I'm literally, I'm not making it. I don't know who's in charge. You may, you may know. Uh, and you may. You may know more than me. Uh, and then the next week, after the president announced what we're going to do, he uh, gave two speeches at the UN. And one, he said, it's a national security issue. We're going into this. And he went to the National Security Council, uh, which has authority uh, to actually break those boundaries. It's the only agency in the world that has authority to break those national boundaries. And then he also said it's a public health issue. And I guess you could argue it's both. But for clarity and for planning purposes, it's nice, it's nice to know which one, all right? Because you can send the military in to do public health, but we hardly ever do that. We did it in Haiti, but, uh, but that's about it. Because people wonder when the military comes, you know, who's coming there? And most people like Doctors Without Borders were happy to have the military come in to build hospitals. They want nothing to do with the military in terms of giving care, all right? That's historic. Historically, their creed is, no military involvement. The exception is when there's nothing else that can be done. There's no other agency that can help. Right? And The Lancet this week did an editorial asking the question, well, maybe we should set up the military as the presumed responders in the future. I think that's like a horrible idea, not because they don't like the military, but they're separate things. Right? The military literally is trained to go kill people. All right? and, they, and that's their job. I'm not, not, not arguing about that. They're not trained to do this. Now, there's a whole coin thing, you know, counterinsurgency thing. We should get, get, uh, get involved with that, et cetera. But anyway, that's a big deal to talk about and to try to get policy on uh, is what we want the, want the military to do. And then, uh, the, so, so if it's military, it's federal government, obviously. It's the feds taking the lead and the feds are doing everything. Uh, the states have nothing to do with that. If it's civilian, uh, it's mixed. And the place you look at the mixed stuff is all this stuff about airport security and coming into the airport, right? And we've got these rules. This is the feds. This is guy is the uh, quarantine uh, head in the CDC giving a talk at uh, JFK Airport when they set up this screening, this wonderful screening, uh, which caught uh, this nurse from uh, who we hear all about on the, on, the, on the news, and Professor Mariner will talk about that, and got Governor Christie convinced that he's the one who's going to do Ebola response in the United States. <laughs> uh, so on this question, is it the states, federal government, or both? I'll turn it over to Professor Mariner. Thank you very much. I turn the light down? Okay. Um, so, I, my name is Wendy Mariner, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the domestic response, which perhaps has not been exemplary. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, um, but I must say that I was very pleased to learn from Alan Sager on my way over here that yellow was the color of the flag denoting smallpox quarantines at the turn of the century, or prior century. Um, so I thought, how lucky I came exactly appropriately dressed. <laughs> um, although it's not smallpox, but it certainly feels like that kind of era uh, at the moment. Um, I, I've asked to talk about the domestic response uh, on law and policy. Uh, two things you should notice. There's a space between law and policy, because I think there has been a space between law and policy in this country. It's not entirely clear that the policies uh, comport with law, and it's not entirely clear that the law knows what the policies should be. And to quote a blogger, uh, 
what did we get for all that preparedness funding? Right? We're supposed to be jumping right in to all kinds of hazards. Now, I will come back to the fact that I think Massachusetts is actually doing a good job, but they're a rare bird in um, some of these circumstances. Where's the little clicker? Oh, well. Um, so we have our first death, notably of African origin, unfortunately. Um, and you can see the mixed responses. We have President Obama um, congratulating people who had returned from providing care in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and uh, at the same time, we have Casey Hickox being uh, stuck in the New Jersey uh, tent outside a hospital in Newark. Uh, a fellow by the name of Ryan Boyka, who has recently gone public, who was one of the doctoral students at Yale in public health, who was taken to the went to the hospital with a, with a colleague who he'd been working with abroad, but only working on Department of Health computer systems, not treating patients, um, was found not to have um, Ebola tested negative, but is being asked, now f required, uh, with the police outside his apartment to stay home in quarantine um, uh, in just for the rest of the 21 days. So it's an interesting mix. Uh, the kinds, I know you can't read this, so I'll read it to you. These are kind of different quotes that people are taking across the country. Uh, Governor Christie, as you may know, has been fairly strong on this. He says, my job is to protect the health and safety of people of New Jersey and the region. Um, when he said, when he was raised the question that he might be sued, he said, I've been sued lots of times, get in line. Um, he probably wants to tell her to sit down and shut up like he did the fellow in the news this morning or yesterday. Uh, a heckler uh, upset him about Sandy response and he told him, sit down and shut up. Um, one, Matt, he was interviewed on Matt Lauer uh, last week or so, and Matt Lauer asked him, was she really sent back to Maine because she no longer had a fever or symptoms, or was she sent back to Maine because she went out and hired a talented lawyer like Norm Siegel to, and was threatening legal action against the state? He said, no, no, I just did it out of the goodness of my heart. No, he didn't say that. He said, <laughs> he said his job is to protect the health and safety of the people of New Jersey and the region. And that's always the response, right? Out of an abundance of caution. And as George Annis says, when you hear somebody say, out of an abundance of caution, you know they have no facts behind them um, because they are operating, you know, extra factually. On the other hand, you have the editors of the New England Journal um, arguing in, the, in an editorial this week that the governor's action is like driving a carpet tack with a sledgehammer. It gets the job done, but overall is more destructive than beneficial. Hundreds of years of experience show that to stop an epidemic of this type requires controlling it at its source in other countries, right? Um, and the New York Times editorial interestingly came out as though they're physicians, but they do say there's absolutely no public health justification for mandatory quarantines. And President Obama, uh, as you heard, says we need to be having our uh, guidance based on science, and it's un which it shouldn't be necessary, we shouldn't have policy that proves an obstacle to those who risk their lives and livelihoods to head overseas to help those in need. We don't just react on, based on our fears, we react based on facts. Well, some do, some don't. Um, and we have a question of, between the feds and the states, who is in charge here? This all of a sudden comes back to people calling you up on the phone all the time asking, well, is this legal? Um, and the fact that we should still be asking this question is quite astonishing to me. Um, actually, it's not. <laughs> and we have Governor Christie and Governor Cuomo, who originally said that uh, quarantines would be unenforceable and then uh, signed on to a requirement for quarantine for all those returning from these countries. Um, President Obama, again, trying to argue that we should be respectful of and congratulate people who've come taking care of those in other countries. Um, Tom Frieden we haven't heard from recently. And nobody's heard from the czar, who's <laughs> working quietly behind the scenes. So I'm betting this guy, if he were alive, uh, would get things done. So we have what amounts to, in this country, the wonderful world of American federalism. And it makes, the, it makes for at least 51 jurisdictions and types of law. Uh, we have oops, the federal 
the federal law, which of course deals with national security, foreign commerce, interstate commerce, immigration, naturalization, border control, and customs, to name a few that are relevant here. And so they could take some action. They have only taken uh, recommendations finding that uh, both the president, the NIH, Tony Fauci, who says New Jersey and New York's guidelines are draconian, was the word he used. Um, and CDC said there's really no need to forcibly quarantine everyone who's coming back from these countries. It is, as Dr. Di Maria has said, dependent on um, an exposure and the, the likelihood that an infection has developed. But, of course, even within the federal government, we now have the Secretary of Defense saying, well, we're going to quarantine the, the seclude the uh, troops that are returning from particular countries. Uh, but the military can frankly do whatever it wants. In the state, there's such a broad concept of um, the so-called police power that states can uh, protect the, the safety, health, and welfare of people within the state jurisdiction. And so New York and New Jersey and all the other uh, states can take certain kinds of deci uh, can decisions about what kind of policy to, to implement. Uh, and at the moment, there are quarantine policies in that really are for anyone who has uh, been within one of the Ebola outbreak countries in the past 21 days in Connecticut, Florida, I guess Illinois, Minnesota, New York, New Jersey, and Virginia. Maryland, uh, Governor Christie included in his calculation, but if you take a look at Maryland's policy, it's actually quite sensible. Um, and it follows very much what uh, the current CDC guidelines are. And I'm going to suggest that that's because Josh Sharstein, who is Commissioner of Health, in Maryland is a graduate of Boston University and did an MPH here <laughs> and was my student. Um, <laughs> so I got some great students here, including Mary Clark, the former student. So, <laughs> um, so we've got a little disconnect here again. Now the CDC, this is uh, what Al has described to you, uh, the current status. It, it flummoxed people that there were different recommendations and I think the CDC, to its credit, was trying to be non-hyperbolic uh, in responding to questions about what should be done. Uh, and these are risk categories, and it's, there's not necessarily any uh, immediate jump into uh, involuntary quarantine. Um, so let me just spend a minute talking about what would the legal basis in a state be for uh, imposing quarantine on someone. And the best we have I, there, the statutes in each state range from the very general, which New Jersey has. It has a very general statement to very specific uh, detailed statutes. In general, however, um, well, not in general, but the Constitution does place limits on when and why government officials can deprive individuals of their freedom to move about. That should not be a surprise. There are some constitutional limits. And the Supreme Court has developed a two-part test that has been applied in cases of civil commitment of individuals who are mentally ill and dangerous. And it is a two-part test. It requires that one be mentally ill and that one uh, will probably harm others because the mental illness makes it difficult to control their behavior. Now, the Supreme Court has never decided a case involving commit civil commitment for contagious diseases, but most states have that have seen cases like this, and there are, there are not many, uh, apply an analogous test. And you can see that they really are similar in concept, that a person should have a serious contagious disease. Ebola would qualify, pink eye would not, annual flu would not, cold. Uh, and there must be a probability that the individual will transmit this infection to other people by their behavior if they're not confined. What's being lost in most of the public discussion is number two. Everybody assumes that if you have a contagious disease that is transmissible by definition, then you must spread it to others. But that's not the point. If that were true, think of all the people in this country with tuberculosis that would be locked up. And they're not. Why not? Because they don't pose a danger. They can take precautions and not spread the disease. So um, this is based on how much time we got. Um, I will not, be, this is my uh, evidence, too bad. Um, <laughs> interestingly, 
There is a case in New Jersey from 1993, which Christie obviously has not read, um, which does point out that one has to be careful. Uh, it did apply the two-part test. It was a case involving a tuberculosis. Um, but it does point out that the claim of disease in a domestic setting has the same kind of power as the claim of national security in matters relating to foreign policy. Both claims are very powerful arguments for executive action. Both claims are among those least likely to be questioned by any other branch of government and therefore subject to abuse. The potential of abuse is a special concern when the other interest involved is the confinement of a human being who's committed no crime except to be sick. So paying attention to this sort of human rights, and he should, you should know that he quoted extensively from Professor Annis in this, <laughs> in this opinion, so of course he's right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that leaves us with uh, uh, the different kinds of statutes. How do they play out? Well, the New Jersey statute <laughs> itself is very, very general. It says that the state has um, the power to maintain a, and enforce proper and sufficient quarantine whenever deemed necessary. So who decides what's necessary? Um, Maine, where uh, Casey Hickox is at the moment, has a slightly more demanding one, which requires, clear and, which requires the health department to submit clear and convincing evidence that a person requires immediate custody in order to avoid a clear and immediate public health threat. Um, the governor of Maine has apparently withdrawn his request for a court order to uh, impose involuntary quarantine on Casey Hickox this morning. Uh, one might speculate that's because he couldn't meet this standard. The evidence would have to be pretty strong uh, that, there, that she would present a clear and immediate public health threat. So what now? Uh, this is where Casey Hickox lives. If you look just over there, it's Canada. <laughs> uh, this is a pretty remote place, and if I were waiting my 21 days, I think I would be closer to an academic medical center. But um, <laughs> anyway, the, you know, what, what do we do now? Uh, I, there are three things. One is that we need capacity. We need medical and public health professionals to go to the source. And we need public health officials who are courageous enough to stand by the evidence and not be bullied into uh, reacting to public fear just to satisfy politics, and we need, oops, uh, a courageous legal system with judges that will not also say, lock them up, I don't want to be the one to blame, I'm not a doctor. I insert the word courageous at the suggestion of my um, colleague Leonard Glantz because I thought that this would, we just need sensible people, but in this day and age, they probably have to have some courage to do the right thing. Thank you. And we will take questions. If you have a question, why don't you go to one of the microphones so that you can be heard. Go right ahead. Thank you. Hello. I'm Tony Robbins, a adjunct faculty member here at the U School of Public Health. And uh, I have a question that uh, seems to me to be obvious, but you're not the only group that hasn't mentioned my topic. Uh, that is to say, in addition to all the public health laws we have, in the United States there's something called the Occupational Safety and Health Act. And under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the employer has a responsibility to provide a safe and healthy workplace. Now, I'm aware, because I was the director of NIOSH many years ago, and as such, I was part of the Centers for Disease Control, that CDC is totally blind to the problems of workers. Uh, at least w they were 35 years ago, and it doesn't appear that they've changed. I note that Tom Frieden, when talking about one of the nurses who had uh, contracted this disease, said, uh, 
the woman appears to have breached protocol. All that I can learn, and I've been trying to learn, is that most hospitals don't have appropriate protocols in place. Uh, I will say that OSHA hasn't adopted the CDC guidance as an emergency temporary standard, which they might well do. But I also see that the International Labor Organization hasn't been involved. And I was going to ask Mary, where is the occupational health group in the Department of Public Health when it comes to uh, managing the, these problems? And uh, I, you got the idea. I Thank you. So we have expanded our group from the original group to include or to begin to include a work group with the occupational health group so that they can weigh in on PPE. Um, we have been getting guidance from Dr. Di Maria and others about what to recommend to hospitals, looking at what they should do to provide a safe workplace, as well as focusing on the training that they need to begin putting into place. But they are part of the, the response now as we have expanded our incident command. George, when yeah, uh, what I would say about that is, uh, you know, Ebola may not be a major public health issue, although we're treating it like it is in this country, but hospital-acquired infections are. And, you know, we just are not taking that seriously enough, I don't think, although Al may differ with that, but I think we're not. No, you know, I'd say we're not doing enough because it's never, it's never enough never as enough. long as their <laughs> preventable infections are occurring. I was very troubled by what happened in Dallas because I think, and I think in sort of analyzing what happened and learning from the experiences that when you say droplet and contact precautions, I think for most people working in hospitals, for most working, people working in healthcare, you take it for granted, well, that's something we do every day. We know how to do that. And, and I think the lesson here is maybe it was, even if you did it right, maybe it wasn't enough to protect you from, protect you from Ebola. And secondly, how do we know we're really doing it right? Who's watching out for how people are doing these precautions? So I think, you know, I, I'm glad that we're doing what we're doing now in terms of the CDC's recommendations for, um, for precautions for people working with Ebola patients. And I think we've learned a lot from, from Emory and from Nebraska as well in terms of what should be done. It's just unfortunate that we, it took two people getting sick for us to learn that. But what strikes me is I've heard anecdotally only um, a number of people working in hospitals saying they didn't have a clue how to respond and were simply told to go to the CDC website. And the planning that occurs, there may be excellent plans and excellent policies in place, uh, but the assumption of those who make the plans and policies and put them up on the website may be, well, everyone will naturally read them and will practice and train. And I think that's um, a very generous assumption. That the, therefore, there has to be more follow-up than simply making good, good policies. Hi. Uh, sorry, I, I wanted to thank you for uh, the information. I thought it was really um, useful and very helpful. Um, I uh, am from the School of Management, and I signed up to, with the CDC as um, an HR or logistical person um, to go to West Africa and have gotten a lot of responses from what I would call shell companies. Um, so these are like the IOM and AmeriCares, for instance, are attached to this company that um, was hired to hire 600 people. And so now I'm looking to go to West Africa. They want me to leave in two weeks, but I, the website for this company makes it look really dodgy. Um, so what I was wondering from you all is, um, and, and sorry, my, my father who worked in the government for a long time said, uh, just because they got a government grant doesn't mean that they're good at doing what they're doing. That means they're good at writing grants. Um, so what I want to know is what questions I should ask um, about the organization, uh, what I should do um, sort of to understand who these people are and what, uh, how, how prepared they are to respond. Um, if, if they have logistical backgrounds but not public health backgrounds, is that enough or what, what should I know about them? Thank you. I always look to Al in these instances. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I, yeah. this, is, this is a difficult question because a lot of people ask questions, who should I go with? And, which NGOs are, are better at uh, making sure people get all the information that they need 
and what is the information that you need. And I think it, it, it's very hard to say that unless you're already involved. You know, I, I think the people actually involved in the response, MSF now, Partners in Health, uh, you know, I think they do a lot of advanced work. They had, and MSF has already had a lot of experience oh, in yeah. country. That, that those are the agencies that would have the best the best information about what is needed. I mean, certainly MSF is very well organized and very disciplined, and uh, you know, I, I would seek out their their guidance. I would also go, probably go through whatever training and go through here. I know the healthcare workers now the NGOs are requiring them to go through the uh, CDC training in Aniston for three days, just to don and doff the uh, PPE, and I, and I think that's worthwhile. It might even be worthwhile if you're going there in a non-clinical role because you may be called upon in, under, or you may volunteer to do certain things that maybe would require PPE. So I, I think you just have to search out uh, what, what information is available, and I think the most reliable sources are the NGOs that are already doing this kind of work. And I, think, I think that's right. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I also know that there are um, healthcare facilities, when they're talking with their um, staff about whether they may want to volunteer, they have put together checklists for people to go through as they evaluate which organizations they might work with. And if you want to get in touch with me after this, I'd be happy to try to connect you with some of that. Hi, my name is Willie Baker. I'm an emergency physician here at Boston Medical Center. And I have some um, role in the city in the Conference of Boston Teaching Hospital, so I have some idea what goes around on around the city. I have a couple of comments and then one request from my public health colleagues. So we actually do have, just to reassure you, we do have some awareness and expertise in PPE, donning and doffing. And uh, going back many, many years, we have had plans in place, as, as Al knows, for referral of contagious diseases. And we even have had Ebola-specific plans here at BMC before this latest outbreak. So we're not starting from scratch, although we still think that we have more work to do and we're working on it. Going back to um, your point, we are really worried as healthcare workers about exposure. And I agree with Al entirely. This is very similar to HIV with respect to fear. But I disagree with respect to the basis of the fear um, because of the uh, caseload in healthcare workers with respect to the burden of disease. And going back to SARS in Toronto, um, the highest burden of disease was amongst healthcare workers. Okay. And there was one study that showed a 6% per shift risk to critical care nurses for acquiring the disease. So that's in the mind of, of healthcare workers. And my request to the public health community is to consider this as an opportunity to help correct some of the things that make it difficult for us in medicine to address these things. And you guys are all on top of that on some level, but for us, for my lenses, my glasses, emergency department overcrowding is the biggest problem and one of the biggest obstacles for us in screening this. Imagine the person showing up with a fever to a very crowded ED, may be able to make a brief statement to a screening triage person and then being told to sit in a waiting room along with all the other people with fevers and nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. And those are my comments and questions. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, did you have a suggestion as to what public health people can do to help you? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but we only have a half hour left. Well, a brief suggestion. <laughs> The brief suggestion is to focus um, more of our efforts on overcrowding. And that is, a, that is a complex problem that has many, many, many causes. And I know this is an Ebola-focused seminar, so I don't want to take much more time on that. But um, a lot of it has to do with how we pay for health care, how patients end up in the ED, why it's okay. their safety net, the access to care. <laughs> the outflow problems because the biggest problem in ED overcrowding is outflow. It's not inflow. It's not processing people, you know, deciding what's wrong with them and where they should go. It's getting them out of the department. And usually that problem is getting them into an inpatient bed and that has to do with the economics of running the, the hospitals. And as Paul Farmer would say, I'm not going to speak for him, it's a 
problem of poverty as well. And I, and I guess health care reform didn't fix it. <laughs> you know, I, I think that you raised some very serious issues that I think we do have to address. And, and it's very hard for, for, you know, I think the, the problem is from our standpoint in the department, we want to be as supportive as possible and identify resources. But the conditions are so particular in, in various facilities and what works best in some facilities doesn't work so well in others and vice versa. So it, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. And, and uh, I, I, I agree with you that addressing the underlying problem for all of the emergency departments would go a good way to help figure out how to do the logistical management that's required for dealing with the potential for one of these patients showing up. Because it is scary. It's scary for everybody. Wendy? Um, I have nothing to add to this because I think that's a serious problem and one that does have to be addressed, although I'm not sure we're here. To, we can do it today. But it does remind me that there has been conversation about whether there should be uh, a regional or designated hospital to receive Ebola patients or receive patients uh, in that are sick or potentially sick in any outbreak, uh, that there has been among the hospitals some concern or resistance to that. And I wondered, uh, since I suspect you've been familiar with that discussion, if, if that might be relevant here and maybe Dr. DeMaria could address it. Um, I, that is actually is on the table, but I know you guys know about this more than, perhaps more than I do. We do have a conference call tomorrow to discuss that and other issues. I'll say that there's, there's probably going to be more opposition than, uh, than agreement with that uh, concept. And can you explain why? Uh, I don't think that I'm in a position to <laughs> explain why. It would probably be very dangerous for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't, you know, I obviously I can't say anything very specific except that, you know, the discussions are going on, and I think it's very complicated. It's, it's a complicated circumstance because, you know, everybody wants to, let's say everybody wants to do the right thing and take care of patients who may show up with Ebola. To prepare for that has substantial implications in terms of cost and opportunity costs and direct costs and opportunity costs. And, uh, you know, I think everybody's making an effort to do it on their own. And you could say, well, you know, why is every hospital in the state doing it on their own? And in, in which case having referral hospitals would make sense. Um, but, you know, you have to set aside space. You have to consider all the ancillary issues, including laboratory testing. You have to uh, train, train staff, you have to train specific staff and enough of them to do this. So while you're doing all that, you're not doing a lot of other things that maybe you should be doing. You're, you're taking space out of commission and there's no reimbursement for, for any of that. So it makes it very difficult. And then you have this whole, uh, you know, if you get recognized as the Ebola hospital, people stop wanting to have their elective surgery there. That has, re and, you know, the hospitals have to stay in business. So. You know, all of that is understood, but it doesn't change the fact that we may have an Ebola patient show up at any time, and they have to be taken care of, and they have to be taken care of in a way that's effective for their care and is, uh, prevents anybody else from getting Ebola, whether they're healthcare workers or the general community. So uh, there is an attempt to try to, to work that out. And any way it's worked out has to be a system. It can't just be a couple few Ebola hospitals because patients are not going to, Oh, you know, I think I have Ebola. I'll go to the Ebola hospital. They're going to go. <laughs> they're going to go to their own clinic, their own doctor, their own regional or neighborhood emergency department, and they're going to have to be evaluated there, to the extent of ruling out other conditions before they get sent to wherever they're going to get care if they have a high risk of having Ebola. So I, I think we're going to have to build a system to deal with those kinds of patients and. And, you know, I think the, the optimists will say, well, that will put us in good stead for the next challenge. But I think we, we need to do it now for Ebola. And, you know, that's, that's the way I see it. I mean, it may wind up. We've had cases where people have shown up eight days. Let me give you an example. Eight days from Liberia with high spiking fever. And uh, patient presents to community hospital. The community hospital contacts us sort of with the idea of where, where do we send this patient. We said, well, you know, there's nowhere to send them. You have to sort of deal with them, you know. And, and, and this particular community hospital just rose to the occasion. They, they, they consulted, you know, they did the appropriate uh, precautions. They evaluated the patient. They actually called somebody in who knew how to do a malaria smear because they didn't want to put it through the usual processes. They did the malaria smear. It was loaded with 
fell sick from malaria, they treated the guy. And, and then at that point, they even decided to keep him for 24 hours observation in case he had malaria and Ebola. So, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, and I think that could be, you know, I, I think many hospitals in the state would, would take that, you know, once, once they had to deal with it, they would deal with it well. But it would be better if we had a system and everybody was trained how to do it appropriately. And, and would you, you know, I think there's no, no getting out of this. We're going to have to come up with a way of, uh, of affecting that uh, despite the cost. Yeah, I was actually going to ask a, a question about the article that says, you know, Boston Medical Center will be ready in seven months when it builds some sort of special room to, to do this. And people talk about the, the planning uh, of this, but somebody with Ebola is like wait, waiting for anyone to plan, or someone with the, the symptoms are going to show up at some random hospital. And then the question is, what will these hospitals do? Well, as the hospital in Dallas did, I assume that we would do it better, and sort of what is the, the guidance from the state. But, but along with that, I wanted to ask about the politics of it, because, you know, Governor Christie's response is a political response, which is you have to be tough on terrorism, and you have to be tough on Ebola, right? It's sort of the same kind of thing. And I don't care what those doctors say. My job is to protect the people of the, the state. And I'm wondering if the public health people in the state can describe at all whether there have been political pressures. I mean, from the legislature, there were hearings the other day. How does the politics of epidemics, how does that fit into your work? <laughs> I'm sure you want to talk about that. I think I hear my phone. <laughs> I have to honestly say, you know, I don't, th I don't, you know, we've been under the gun. There, there certainly, there were hearings in mm -hmm. the legislature. There was a lot of criticism of the department. I think, you know, that's what we're supposed to respond to is criticism. I think we have to be held accountable, uh, and I think that's happened. But I haven't, uh, you know, I, I think there's been a willingness to do what the best evidence suggests, and um, I'm glad I don't live in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> No offense to anybody from New Jersey. <laughs> um, and, and I would agree with Al. I think part of this job is that we are accountable, and I think what the government looks to us for is to explain why our recommendations are our recommendations and what our scientific basis is for that, and to be sure that we have thought through what the implications are and that we were think, thinking of whatever possible unintended consequences there could be, and I think that's part of the job of working for a state or a local governmental agency. Um, if we can't explain why it is that we need to do something and why it's the right thing to do, then we probably shouldn't be making those decisions or those recommendations. So that, I think, is what we've been expected to do, is explain why it is that this is our guidance. And when the guidance changes, <coughs> um, as it does, I think then we have to go back in and say, we learned this from this example. We saw this in Texas, so we have to go back and look and change what we're doing because we can't get into a position where we get hidebound in what we're telling people to do because we're afraid to change based on what we've seen. And so part of the challenge is also being able to explain that, that we don't know everything. We are going to see things that change and we need to be able to go back in and say we're going to change our guidance because of this and explain why that's important. We can't get stuck with the idea that we have said X, so we are going to stick with X no matter what else we see because X is where we're going. Um, and I think that raises challenges because it's a communications challenge and it's an education challenge. But I, you see that in every event, I think, not just this, not SARS, not, H, not just H1N1. Our responsibility is, as government people is to explain what it is and make the best case that we can. Wendy. Just a brief note, the reason that I, that I walked up here with a large stack of paper um, is because these are, are the public health regs on communicable diseases and surveillance and isolation and quarantine. And they've listed Ebola and restrictions that are and are not necessary forever. Well, mm -hmm. I don't know forever, but for a <laughs> very long time. So uh, the Massachusetts, I would commend for having all having thought through this for a very long time. That's a little different from what we've learned about the hands-on uh, clinical care, 
of, of patients, which may be evolving. But we, I think we are in better shape by far in Massachusetts because we do have knowledge and have developed uh, regulations and guidelines and do have responsible people in charge who are willing to stand up and, and defend their positions and explain themselves and change as the facts change. We have two additional questions, one and two. Hi, uh, my name is John Bethard and I am an assistant professor here in the anatomy and neurobiology department. Uh, but I'm trained as a biological anthropologist um, who routinely deals with human remains in any state mm. of condition that they may be in from skeletonized to decomposing to any number of circumstances. And I, I have a million questions about oh. some of the on the ground oh. things happening in West Africa. But my question that, I've, that I'm interested in uh, specifically deals with the CDC protocol that just came out about how people are supposed to deal with remains um, of people who have died. Um, and it's pretty specific, uh, <coughs> and it, it made me think, I forget your name in the yellow. I forget. Wendy. Yeah, yeah. Wendy. Um, I was in the overflow room, and I couldn't hear so well. But um, what happens when, you know, I mean, and I think it's probably, you know, inevitable that the case in Texas is one where a person dies, they're infected with Ebola, and the regimented, um, you know, sort of formaldehyde curtain of CDC protocol sort of doesn't take into account what people want to do in a mortuary context or a burial context. So how do we, is there a way to give the body any kind of human rights or family members rights or anything like that so that it's not sort of such stigmatized, you know, get them away, cremate them, do these things that might not take into account what people want? I mean, you actually said it just right. It's the body doesn't have any rights. Right. But the right. family may. The yeah. family usually has the right to bury their, their loved one. And there may be ways to do that that are safe. I don't know. I'd have to ask Al. What is there, do we have to incinerate an Ebola body immediately and not let the family view it even or take yeah. part in some kind of a burial? Now, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I think this is sort of a theoretical circumstance. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, so that each case is going to be individual. I mean, the, the goal here is to protect people from Ebola because we know that that's a, in a worldwide basis, that's an incredibly risky situation yeah. to any kind of funeral ritual is potentially, that doesn't involve, you know, adequate infection control it is probably one of the riskiest things and it accounts for a lot of the transmission in the, in the places where this occurs. And I think it is, you know, the, basically the CDC says, you know, the, the body goes into a body bag and then goes into a hermetically sealed casket and then can either be buried or cremated. So that, that's basically for the identified uh, Ebola patient what's, what's recommended. Uh, you know, I can foresee a circumstance where family would be offended or upset by that. And I think we just have to take care of that on, on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. I think. My experience in dealing with people under significant circumstances, not exactly this, but similar where you're asking them to do something that may be not the cultural norm or not something that they really want to do, if you really explain the reasons why you're doing it, that it's very rare that uh, it becomes sort of a litigious uh, situation. Yeah, I'm Lee Wetzler. I'm in the section of infectious diseases, so we obviously hear a lot about this. We even have a beeper now that we get There's calls regarding this, an Ebola beeper. But the, the, I think that getting back to designating hospitals, I think it would be stupid not to. I, I don't know if anyone's ever put on BL3 level PPE, but this is not just kind of gowning and putting a mask on and everything else. It, and and if, if Nahid was still here, she would uh, explain that to you, and she's already shown us, and we're get, okay. getting being shown this again, but it's highly specific. And it's not the putting it on that's a problem, it's the doffing. Mm -hmm. And I think unless you really develop specialized units, let's say in each city, um, you know, you, that's one way you really can prevent this secondary spread. I mean, the reason why you had secondary spread in Dallas, other than the fact that they sent the guy out with a fever at first, was the fact that they didn't have the proper equipment to begin with. And, and that's the other thing, too, is that are you going to send all this proper equipment to every hospital that could possibly see a patient, or are you going to try to, you know, centralize some of those things? And I think it's stupid not to. And the idea that, you know, there'd be 
you know, stigmatized because they'd be in Bowl Hospital. I don't think Emory feels that way or the NIH or Nebraska. I think if anything, they feel, yeah, we can handle anything. So I, I, I think when you have this call tomorrow, you know, I think that, that would be something that's really important to consider, whether it's BMC or some other place. And regarding the units that we're trying to put together, they're not, I mean, this type of units they have down at NIH and, uh, <coughs> and in Emory, you know, they're, I mean, the, the, the regard, not just negative pressure, but the whole system set up. I and mean, we, have neg we have these negative pressure rooms here. We do have places already that we can put people, just that it's putting it in a very specific area. Um, and the, the only comment I have is regarding perceived fear versus actual risk and the way that the media has pumped this up is really, I mean, we see this all the time and it just, this is the thing that gets me most angry regarding any of this that happened with SARS, that happens with, I mean, I'm surprised it hasn't happened with MERS as much, but you know. It is surprising. Yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, oh. so I'll leave it with that. Just uh, let me ask you one question, because I think you're right. I think that we look at Emory and NIH and Nebraska as, and like full service hospitals, they can right. handle everything, but there are many hospitals in this town who want to be looked at that way and wouldn't want another hospital well, looked at that way. I, I mean, no, I understand, but I okay. think the one unique aspect here is that you have people here already that have experience working with BL3 and BL4 level organisms that have done this stuff, you know, we, that we've been dealing with this. And I think there's reasons why maybe here versus others. You know, fine, you know, the, you know Harvard wants to say, I see, you know, but. To, you know, we'll see. I mean, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm wondering if in your collective experience there's been conversations at a systemic level of what we can do about racism that's going to potentially result from the fear epidemic. And what I worry about is, you know, people of Western African origin or even just African origin in general, this becoming an a 9-11 incident where there's fear directed from any, fear directed towards discrimination, racism directed toward anybody with that origin. And you know, if that's part of our systemic conversations about how, how can we attempt to control for some of that or to protect people from that sort of discrimination or racism? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> But that's absolutely right. I mean, you saw all the international mm -hmm. documents are all directed to treating everybody the same. Non-discrimination, if there's one principle for international human rights law, it's non-discrimination. Right, I thought of it too when I saw that slide. Okay, yeah. right, good. And I don't know the systemic solution to it, but I do know one of the things that we do at the department, we have a global health group, and one of the first things they did was reach out to the communities to talk with them, give them information, find out what sort of questions were coming up and what the department could do that would be supportive and what other things were needed. And that contact has continued over the course of this so that we have um, an avenue to get information and try to monitor what's going on and provide information um, as best we can. So that's not a systemic solution, but it is something that, that we do in the department during events where there is a possibility like this. Professor Brian? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I just wonder if, uh, as a panel, you'd like to comment on what you think about how out of proportion this whole Ebola discussion is when you think that today more children in Africa will die from pneumonia than have ever died from Ebola. More children will die today from diarrheal disease than will ever die from Ebola. Today and tomorrow, more children will die from, from malaria than will ever die from Ebola. But the effort and energy that is going in beyond just the fear epidemic um, is, it's as if none of those children ever exist. And I just wonder if you'd like to comment on that. Well, this is, it, Specialists in risk perception will tell you that we've heard about these poor children in other continents for so long that it no longer registers in our consciousness and that the only thing that strikes us as frightening at the moment and a real risk is something that is brand new. Also, Ebola has never really jumped um, from many of these, from these countries into the United States, so that all of a sudden raises its level. The rest are background risks. And, and I think that we've, that, that that enables us to ignore 
these far more widespread, um, you know, far more fatal illnesses that have that do exist around the world, and I think it's unfortunate. Um, and I don't know quite how to do it because people perhaps get a little tired of being beaten over the head with all the deaths that are happening. I, I, I it's they begin to what grow scabs and say we 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 can't hear it any longer. There has to be a better way to engage the public in supporting the kinds of efforts that we need uh, all around the world. It's a funny way to say it, but in some ways, this is an opportunity also uh, to, I mean, the groups like Partners in Health, even though they, they'd say they don't do emergency relief, but they're doing it this time because they want to build a, a, a health care system, a sustainable health care system, and they're going to try to do that. That would be worthwhile. That would cover these other diseases as well. But one big tragedy is that in, mo in the, most of these three countries, there's only room in the hospitals for Ebola patients, as you know. There's not room for childbirth people who do have malaria or have all, many other diseases. And, and even though they were always dying, they're dying at much higher rates right now. And you're right, they get no, no press attention at all. We just, I want to say we just care about the Ebola patients. But uh, they got our attention because we got Ebola here in the United States. That's true. Now, how c is there a way, and I'm not an expert communicator, advertiser, but is there a way to turn that and get the, get the, uh, get Americans to say, yeah, no, I guess we should be interested in the whole healthcare system in, in West Africa. Okay. I want to thank Harold Cox for arranging today's session and taking the leadership to bring us together, and I want to thank the members of the panel for their comments and presentations. Thank you very thank much. You.